me. If you have any, you can give it to me. I'll take care of it for you. Um, the big question today is, uh, is essentially set up by a paradox, um, which is, I think most of us would agree that for the last 60, 50, 60 years, the U.S. has been the, if not the if not the dominant, certainly the preeminent economic power in the world. Um, and yet, uh, even though it's uh, uh, the preeminent uh, economic power in the world, um, it's uh, become a net foreign debtor. American net foreign debt is roughly 41% of U.S. GDP as of last year. And the U.S. runs chronic current account deficits. It buys more than it sells in the world markets. So it's kind of funny if you think about a superpower, economic superpower, as being indebted and um, chronically running trade deficits. And it's even more perplexing when you realize that the US dollar is still used as the um, uh, uh, global reserve currency. And what's even more remarkable about that is that ever since the 1960s, people have been having conniptions over whether the dollar would cease to be that global reserve currency. So we can go from Robert Triffin, who famously posed uh, tr what's called Triffin's Dilemma. Uh, he also was a very self-effacing person, um, Triffin's Dilemma, all the way down to The Economist uh, just last year, worrying about um, the role of the dollar in US uh, geoeconomic power, or hegemony, as the um, economist uh, uh, puts it, because they do understand how the world works. Right? So people have been worrying about the dollar, and they worry about the dollar because of precisely those two things I just pointed out. Chronic current account deficits, and after the uh, 1980s, net foreign debt. So the big question is, um, why do people still use the dollar? And since life is short, and many of you have to rush off uh, to lunch in about five minutes, the answer is uh, to be very simple, and then of course I'll spend the rest of the time explaining it. Um, uh, foreign uh, uh, trade surplus countries um, accumulate dollars in the process of running trade surpluses. Their domestic political economies are uh, not set up to grow unless they have trade surpluses. Once they accumulate those dollars through trade surpluses, they have to do something with them. And what they do is they put them into their banking systems. So it's not just the real economy side of those trade surplus countries, but also their banking systems that are heavily dollar dependent. And this routinized use of the dollar creates what, and these are the, this is perhaps the only time I'll say these words, creates what Michael Mann would call routinized compliance, or what uh, Bordiero would call habitus, um, uh, or what uh, Foucault would call capillary power. If you know these people, great. If you don't know them, don't worry about it. All that you really need to know is they're stuck. That's the simple English language version here. So that's the essence of it, uh, in sort of in the in the sense of the first half. And the second half is, um, if you're holding dollars, why would you keep holding dollars? Well, you're stuck. But I mean, we know people, people, uh, being completely rational actors, people always discount sunk costs, right? All of you, you know, all of you would gladly just abandon all your sunk costs and set out on a new course of life. Uh, just like I'll do after this uh, lecture, and um, and in fact, it's like uh, you know we also have to ask the same question for countries. Why not just cut and run? Why not abandon the dollar? Um, and the answer is people hold dollars in part because they think they're going to get something with them. So the second half is what do they think they're going to get? And the answer is they're going to get even more money, and maybe they'll get something from America if we ever start making something again besides dollars and Facebook. <laughs> okay, so here's. Here's the big question. Go back, now we can go back to the big question. Here's the big question, right? Hyman Minsky, 1968, smart guy. He says, in an anticipation of what you might now call modern monetary theory, he says, well, money, anybody can make money. Anybody can make money. The problem is getting other people to accept it. Lots and lots of organizations print money. Um, if you've been in Ithaca, Ithaca hours is <coughs> kind of money. Uh, if you were living in Denmark in the 1930s, you would have seen pieces of paper circulating um, with the name of towns on them or the names of people on them. It was money, it was used as money. And of course, before um, we get modern central banking, regular old banks used to issue money. 
So the critical problem with money is getting people to accept it. So that's why we ask, why, why would people accept the US dollar? Why would they accept the US dollar? Why don't they think about it the way we think about uh, Zimbabwean dollars? Um, real banknotes, by the way, for those of you who don't know. So that's the, that's the essence of the problem. And um, so here's the new trick, what I'd say, the new trick and dilemma. The old trick and dilemma was that in the 1950s and 60s, under the fixed exchange rate of Bretton Woods, um, the US would put liquidity into world markets, as Trippin put it, put liquidity into world markets, which means we put dollars into world markets. Um, and that was great, it helped the world economy grow, but the dilemma was, by putting more and more dollars into world markets, there was a risk of inflation in the US. And so that undermined confidence in the US economy. Why would you take more dollars if there was a risk that the value of those dollars would fall? And it's the same thing today. Why would you take dollars, right? And the answer is, is somewhat simple, right? You take dollars because it's a, it's a debt instrument. And debt instruments have value because you can, they generate a stream of income and you can use the income to buy stuff. And so we generate a lot of assets that we give to the rest of the world. People don't want to accept your drug lords. People don't want to hold suitcases full of cash in their basement. They want nice, light, transferable pieces of paper. So they want treasury bonds in large denominations, $50,000, okay? So one thing they can, they can get is treasury bonds. And treasury bonds, um, of course, generate a stream of income. But that stream of income is dependent on tax revenue. So if you were looking at the US market, you'd be saying, well, we can take treasuries, we run a trade surplus, we can take treasuries in exchange for our exports. Um, but we might worry about whether those treasuries are backed by tax revenue, because gee, if we're running a trade surplus with the US, and it's not just us, it's everybody else, right? then the US economy clearly is not generating enough goods to fulfill its domestic demand, why would we expect we'll be able to buy something from them, right? After all, once you get your first iPhone, there's no reason to upgrade or get a second one. So why would we expect we'll be able to get something? And those tax revenues are based on production in the US economy, which clearly is inadequate. So why would we trust this? Maybe we'll take something else. Maybe we'll take mortgage bonds. Mortgage bonds are great. There's collateral behind them. People's houses, people make payments on mortgage bonds, right? They pay the the bank, and the bank then puts the money into the, uh, the stream that, that's behind the mortgage bond. And of course, that really works for quite a while in the 2000s until um, something that you only dimly remember now because we've forgotten about it. It's a decade old. <laughs> yeah, I can hardly remember. Um, it, yeah, it doesn't work anymore. So OK, what else is left? Well, there's stocks and bonds, corporate stocks and bonds. And that takes us back to that core question of, is there profit and production in the world economy? Okay? And if there's profit and production in the world economy, then you're gonna, then you're gonna accept these things. Okay? So the big argument here is, again, I'll repeat it since you seem to be interested and you haven't gone off to lunch, the big argument here is um, you have a whole bunch of countries that are structurally demand deficient structurally demand efficient. Why? Who are the big trade surplus economies? Germany, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, okay, Sweden. All of these countries were late developers in the 19th century or the 20th century. Late developing economies get developed by suppressing domestic demand and channeling domestic uh, capital into more production, and you can see already they've got a problem. If they're so mess suppressing domestic demand on the one side, and they're expanding production on the other side, how's that production going to get absorbed? How's supply going to meet demand? The only way supply is going to meet demand is if you export the excess supply. So these countries end up with political institutions, financial institutions, corporate structures, that tend to repress demand, relatively speaking. So they have excess supply, and the excess supply flows into world markets. Changing that requires big structural changes in the domestic economy. It cannot happen 
as Paul Krugman put it once, immaculately. It doesn't happen just because exchange rates, exchange rates happen to change. So all these economies are structurally demand efficient, they export. When they export, they want to get paid, and who can they export to, and what will they take as payment? Well, U.S. economy is the biggest economy in the world, still, and it's the only economy in the world that's capable of generating excess demand, and also, in large quantities anyway, and also it's the only economy in the world that issues a currency that everybody is pretty much willing to take so far. So when these countries export, they accumulate dollars. When they accumulate dollars, they've got to do something with those dollars. You can put them into the bank, but that just shifts the problem from the real economy to the financial sector. Now the financial sector is holding all these dollars. What are they going to do with them? In the economist's world, they would take these dollars, they would go back out into world markets and say, okay, we're a German bank. We operate natively in the old days in Deutschmark. Let's take these dollars and we'll buy up Deutschmark and then we can satisfy claims in our domestic economy. Okay? And similarly, the companies might want to give the dollars to the banks in order to get Deutschmark. But if they do that, the D-mark is gonna appreciate relative to the dollar. And if it appreciates relative to the dollar, Germany's exports are gonna be priced out of world markets. If you're China, you've got the same problem. You're trying to generate growth through exports, you're accumulating a lot of dollars. If you take those dollars into world markets and buy renminbi with them, so you can satisfy claims in the domestic economy, value of the renminbi will rise. You don't want that to happen. So nobody wants to exchange those dollars for their native currency. It's gonna price them out of world markets. So you can't do that. Well, now what? Well, I've got a pile of dollars. What am I gonna do with them? I can buy American assets if I think they're safe, or I can lend them to someone else. Why would somebody else borrow dollars? Well, dollars are, dollars are great. <laughs> and again, you know that, because if I asked you to give me all your dollars, you wouldn't. You can give me your Swedish crowns, too. I know there's some Swedes here. I can use them, since I go there sometimes. Um, I'll take it all, I don't care. But, but dollars are better. Most of my expenses are in dollars. Well, you take dollars because if you start thinking about it, right? Okay, well, oil's priced in dollars, and most of us are oil importers, so we need dollars to import oil. And here's the trick, right? If we're gonna lend money out in dollars, we wanna be repaid in dollars. So both on the lending side from the trade surplus countries and on the borrowing side from many of the trade deficit countries, everyone's operating in dollars. The banks are lending out in dollars, they want dollars to come back. The debtors are borrowing in dollars, they need to earn dollars to satisfy those claims. So the entire global banking system becomes dependent on dollars. Everybody follow that? Okay, now here's the, here's the nitty gritty for the banks. If you're a bank and you wanna, this, this is why it becomes, again, sorry, I said I wouldn't repeat these names, but Michael Mann, Bordeaux, whatever, but this is why it becomes routinized compliance. You're a bank. You've got dollar deposits coming in. You're making dollar loans out. Your balance sheet has these giant dollar positions. If those liabilities out there, sorry, if those liabilities out there to the depositors, right, have to be paid, you're gonna need dollars to pay them. And it looks okay because you have dollar claims, you've got dollar assets in the loans that you've made to people over here. But the problem is, the people over here are taking dollars to invest in stuff that doesn't necessarily generate enough revenue. What happens if those loans become impaired? You've got a problem. In a domestic banking system, it doesn't matter. You've got liabilities to depositors, you've got assets on the other side, let's say in dollars, and you have a capital base that's also in dollars, and behind you is the central bank, the Fed, operating in dollars. It can make as many dollars as it wants. And in fact, in the last decade, they've made trillions of dollars just by pushing little buttons on computer screens. No big deal. So there's no risk there from currency. But if you're a non-US bank, 
produce these dollar assets, there's those dollar liabilities, but your capital base is in euro, or Swedish crowns, or Danish crowns, or British pounds, or Swiss pounds. So if those assets over there get impaired, you've got a problem. You've got to find some way to translate your non-US dollar denominated capital base into dollars. If it's a little bit of impairment, no big deal. You go out into the market, you buy dollars. But if it's 2008 and it's massive impairment, you've got a big problem. You're reliant on the Fed, because the Fed is the only actor that can generate dollars to bail you out. That's the essence of American power theory. Okay. Second bit, which I'll get to later, depending, or maybe not at all, depending on time, is why just, why, why buy, forget the lending, why hold US assets? Why lend, because we just talked in essence about lending to third parties, right? Why hold US assets? And the answer is, you know, like the underpants theory, okay, for those of you who remember that from South Park, anybody? Bueller? Okay, that doesn't make, nobody remembers that either. But, so, um, the other part of it is, the US state generates new technology, and I won't say too much about that, but the US state generates new technologies, these are the basis for American companies that are highly profitable. What people are buying when they buy US assets disproportionately is claims on those companies because those companies have the biggest market capitalization. Okay, so the, the three here is the, re, is the constant recreation of new high technology sectors. Um, and this is based these days on intellectual property rights and Again, it's a reflection of American power. Intellectual property rights require a legal basis. A property right is rooted in law, and the export of American patent, brand, trademark, copyright law to the rest of the world is what secures those streams of income for US companies. Okay, that's the argument, but why believe me? What do I know? I don't have a suit on, so I can't possibly be credible. I didn't go to Georgetown Prep, so I can't possibly be credible. <laughs> so since all I know I learned from John Stevens, I bring a mass of data in front of you. Okay. So number one, trade deficit countries, trade surplus countries. This is an unweighted average, but you can look up the column. And um, household final consumption expenditure over the long run here, 92 to 2017, so we're not talking just one year, 48% of GDP on average for these countries, for the deficit countries, 63%. This is demand deficiency. This is demand deficiency. Some of this is understandable. Saudi, Russia, Norway, oil exporters. I won't go into the details, but by definition, they're gonna be surplus countries. But the rest of these, oh yeah, these are all late developers. Maybe not the Netherlands, but we can argue about that. That's an economic history question. Okay, so demand deficit countries and then uh, demand surplus countries. And unsurprisingly, that translates into trade deficits, trade surpluses. So the US is 51% of the cumulative <coughs> global trade deficit. And not really accidentally, Japan, China, Germany are, um, it's not 51%, but if you put this in dollars, it's about 51% uh, of global trade surplus countries, okay? And so this is the structural dependence. These economies won't grow if they're not exporting, they export to the US. When they export to the US, they accumulate dollars. So here's what banking liabilities, liabilities from bank's point of view are money that's been deposited in the bank. Here's global bank liabilities. US dollar share, pretty typically around 50%. As of last year, it was actually 57% of cross-border banking liabilities. And if you strip out, which I think is actually the right way to do it, intra-European Union, Euro-denominated denominated liabilities, the US share is even larger. Why is it right to strip it out? 
Well, we don't think about loans from banks in Florida to banks in North Carolina as being a cross-border liability, or obviously not, because this is a single currency zone. So likewise, in Europe, I'm not sure that a loan from a Belgian bank to a Dutch bank is really a cross-border liability, particularly because many of these banks are operating across those uh, intra-EU borders. But it doesn't make any difference. You can look at it either way. It's, e it's either half or much more than half, okay? So a lot of cross-border <coughs> liabilities in dollars. When you look at that as a percentage of um, individual national banking systems rather than just global aggregates, you basically see the same pattern. The blue bars here are an average over the last 17 years. The red bar is just to show you it's not much different in the most recent quarter, so I'm not hiding anything. And this is the US dollar share of cross-border banking liabilities by country. Not surprisingly, US banks lend in dollars most of the time. That's no surprise. Not surprisingly, Canadian banks lend in dollars. Also no surprise. Canada is fully integrated, despite what the president seems to think. Fully integrated into the US economy. Japan, Switzerland is basically an extension of the US financial system into Europe. But Japan lends in dollars. That's an interesting thing. And even for the Europeans, and this includes Euro to Euro zone uh, cross-border liabilities, even for the Europeans, it's quite high. So here's your 40% line. That's these eight banks aggregated, and about 37% of their cross-border liabilities are in dollars. This is why they have a problem. There's a problem on the asset side of the balance sheet. Okay. Moreover, Most of the global dollar-denominated loans are being generated by non-US banks. So all of that's to say, at the most basic level, banks taking deposits, making loans, they're heavily involved in using dollars. And structurally, they can't get away from that. Because they've got to do something with those dollars that are coming in from the export. What about more sophisticated, more complicated bits of global banking? Same story. Here's a social network analysis. Did I say, yeah, thank you, Yannick Kinner. I stole this from Yannick Kinner. Um, uh, of for foreign exchange trading in 2016. And you would think, really big economies. The EU, it's a big economy. Japan, it's a big economy. You would think that in most cases, they, and there's a lot of business, right, between the two. You would think they would be doing foreign exchange transactions, euro to yen, yen to euro. But the interesting thing is actually, most of the time they don't. A lot of it flows through the US, through US dollars. Here's the Japan to euro flow. <coughs> so, uh, by the way, out of 200%, because there's two sides to any foreign exchange transaction, typically 90% are in dollars. And what that means is, Almost all transactions are currency X into dollars and then into currency Y. Okay. So on that bit of banking business, they're using dollars. And also, thank you, Jan Kickner. If you look at all transactions, foreign exchange, deposit taking, FDI, portfolio investment, what you see is the centrality of the US financial system at a function, and this is a, a functional level, this is flows, because if you're dealing in dollars, eventually you're gonna go through the US financial system in some way to move the money to wherever you're going. Or you're gonna go through Britain, which is an extension of the US financial system. Okay? So US is central, dollars are central. And again, why does this matter? Okay, let's think about those banking systems again. They're not just doing this international trade. There's they're still mostly domestically rooted. They have domestic clients. They make loans to domestic clients. They're funding investment in domestic economy. So what's the problem? The problem is if they get into trouble on the international side, it's going to impair the domestic side as well. Uh, 
this is a little hard to read from the back. This is not my chart, um, but you'll get the idea. But what you have here is um, Spain, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, the US, Netherlands, Belgium. And this is a what percentage of corporate funding on average from 2016 to 2017 is loans in red versus bonds in blue. Or to put it differently, how much of the banking system from the point of view of corporations is loan-based, how much is security market-based? If you know the literature, we're, this is John Zeisman, updated to 2014. And you know this is Sesame Street also. One of these things is not like the others. Here's the US system. <coughs> it's mostly security markets. If banks get into trouble, companies can still get long-term and actually sometimes short-term finance from the securities market. But in Europe, if banks get into trouble, the real economy is in deep trouble. There's nowhere to get money from. Okay? So you're in a situation in which growth in the economy depends on exports. Exports create dollars. Dollars flow into the banking system. The banking system is structurally dependent on using the dollar because they lend in dollars, they receive income in dollars to satisfy their liabilities. In a crisis, they're reliant on the Fed. Good, everybody got that? That's part one. <laughs> you have questions about that? Seriously, if you have questions about that, I'll take them right now. Okay, all right. Still, the question remains, why take dollars? Okay, I've got some cost. There's all these dollar liabilities, all these dollar assets on the other side of the balance sheet, but you know, I mean, the president of the US is a crazy man. Why wouldn't I stop taking dollars today and say enough, okay, sunk costs, all right. I read the books on sunk costs. My non-cousin Barry Schwartz says we should ignore sunk costs. Kahneman and Tversky say we should ignore sunk costs. Everybody says we should ignore sunk costs. That's yesterday. It's today now. Why don't I change? Give up the smoking, the Doritos, the Fortnite. Become a healthy person, right? It's a real, and this is a serious question. This is the question Triffin actually was struggling with. Why won't the Europeans in those days just stop using the dollar? It will create a crisis. So the question is, why not? And the answer is, actually, they get, first of all, they're getting growth, but also, second, what they're using those dollars for, the assets they buy, generate returns above and beyond what they can get in their own economy. So they're making money from this. So here's the US production side, because Remember, trade deficits, by definition, are a subtraction in GDP accounting. GDP is consumption <coughs> plus investment plus government spending, net of transfers, which is in the other two categories, plus net exports. So if you have a trade deficit, that's a subtraction from GDP. And by definition, therefore, also, the deltas are the same all the way across. So a trade deficit in any given year is a subtraction from GDP. There's some exceptions to this. I'm not going to talk about it. You can hassle me and question and answer about that because it's a distraction. So trade deficits subtract from American growth. That's the confidence part also that Trippin was talking about. So you're looking at the US economy and you say, well, they're running trade deficits. Their economy should be growing slowly. Why would we hold US assets? Why would we hold dollar-denominated stocks and bonds? And the answer is, actually, this whole system, the system of us using us trade export countries, trade surplus countries, using dollars, lowers interest rates in the US and helps the economy grow. And also, the US state generates economic growth through its technology policy. <coughs> so here's why intellectual property rights matter. Just to give you some numbers so we know what we're talking about these things, so small yet so big. Tech, mobile cell phones and services, almost 5% of global GDP in 2017. Intuitively you understand this because I think almost every one of you is holding one right now and since you're bored by the lecture you're probably checking. Right? If you think about how much time you spend on these, right? so 5% of global GDP, when you look at 
individual countries, enormous impact in the economy. This is a bit of a fake, but this is real and this is real. And then if you think more broadly, right, when we talk patents, we think this, but brand, trademark, copyright, Marvel comic book universe, that's copyright. Software, that's copyright. Brands also generate enormous revenues. Um, I have Hortons there uh, because, actually I made this slide when I was in Canada. Do you guys know Hortons? It's what Dunkin' No Longer Donuts is. It's the Canadian version of Dunkin' No Longer Donuts. Tim Hortons. They make better donuts than Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Um, brands generate a lot of money. Okay. And the companies that control these brands and the companies that control intellectual property rights in general, disproportionately American. Growth in the economy today is not old mid 20th century businesses. Growth in the world economy is not steel anymore, contrary again to what some people to the north might think. Growth in the world economy is not as much as you might think it is, cars, okay? Cars, chemicals, machinery. By the way, that's the German economy. <laughs> that's the mid 20th century, again, sorry, fancy words that the literature uses, techno-economic paradigm, growth wave, whatever you want to call it. Today's economy is other things. It's mostly intangible things, which is why we're talking about intellectual property rights. The US economy is growing because of those things, and those things come into being because of the US state's industrial policy. So I give you the giant here, the elephant in the room, and then we can talk about aggregates. So here's Apple um, and the smartphone universe. So here's like, oh, uh, that's that old personal computer world basically flat shipments. Here's smartphones over the last decade. You can see that tapering off. Within that, the iPhone, millions of units shipped, and despite the fact that there are um, only 14% typically of the total, Apple's making 80% of the profits in the cell phone space. Samsung makes most of the rest. Everybody else, including this, this is a Motorola, Lenovo, they lose money, okay? What is it that Apple makes? If we picked up, don't do this, if you pick up your Apple and you drop it on the floor and it shatters into its components and you start looking through for the Apple branded components, you won't find anything. Apple makes nothing physical for the cell phone. Everything in the cell phone is coming from some non-Apple producer. What Apple makes for the cell phone is the iOS and the design, the physical shape. Those are intangibles, they're protected by intellectual property rights. Okay? That's where the money is. And when you aggregate this, you can see some interesting things. And I'll give you the aggregate and then I'll disaggregate again to show you how it works. So, if you take the 2,000 largest firms in the world in any given year, which gives you a universe of about 3,650 firms over these 13 years, because firms float in and out. 2,000 largest firms as Forbes defines it on the basis of profits, sales revenue, assets, market capitalization. What percentage of cumulative profits go to companies that theoretically are headquartered in these countries? That's column one. What's their share of global GDP in 2016? A deliberately chosen comparison to flatter the Chinese. Also, it's difficult, to, too much work to get the average. But if you want to do it for me, I'll change the slide. Second column, and what's the ratio between the two? Oh yeah, hmm, interesting, right? What we see is the US is getting about 34% of profits generated by these firms it's only about 23% of the global economy. It's got a disproportionate share of profit. Um, that mid 20th century economy that everybody thinks is doing really well, kind of punches below its weight. Okay. 
So this is why you hold U.S. assets. You hold U.S. assets because, oh yeah, Apple <coughs> stock, it keeps growing. The stock of companies like Tracen, it's not growing. And when you look at those numbers on a disaggregated basis by sector, what you see is, um, here's the old economy. Uh, old means like when John and I were kids. And then there's the new economy above that. And so what you're seeing here is, again, the same set of companies. What's the cumulative profit they earn? How much is that as a percentage of all, in this case, companies from the US in the Forbes Global 2000? And then what is that as a share of profits for the whole Forbes Global 2000 over those 13 years? And so in the tech space, semiconductors, software, computer services like cloud services, things like that, the US is getting a disproportionate share relative to these old economy countries, although not so much Japan. It's a huge chunk of profits generated by US firms in general. Pharmacy and biotech, basically the same story. And it's only when you drop down to the old economy that you see, oh yeah, Japanese, Germans, they're making money in the car space, but actually not a lot of money relative to these other things. So capitalism is about profits. Assets only have value to the extent that they generate an income stream, stock shares, corporate bonds. The income stream we're talking about is profits. So if you're thinking again about what am I going to hold, you're going to want to hold dollar denominated assets. And then lastly, capitalism is about growth. Where has the growth been? If you're an old economy economy, if you're an old growth wave economy, there's not much growth out there in the world. Americans aren't buying more new cars every year relative to last year. Japanese are not buying more new cars every year relative to last year. Europeans are not buying more new cars every year relative to last year. Chinese are until this last year. But once they do, that's the end of it. So the question is where's the growth sectors? That's what drives net growth. And so again, if you look at the long term, 92 to 2017, what you see is, um, that's why I went to Canada. It wasn't just the Hortons donuts, right? Here's the high growth economies. This is for John's benefit. And then, oh yeah, here down at the bottom, right? The delta on GDP in real local currency terms for Japan, Germany, 25%, 40%. On actually what we really care about, which is human level per capita basis, also much lower than the US. From the capitalist point of view, this is the important one. From the human point of view, this is the important one. But on either measure, these are slow-growing economies. Why are, and now we're back to the beginning. All good movies start at the end and end at the beginning. We're back at the beginning. Why are they slow-growing economies? Oh yeah, they're demand deficient for structural reasons. Because they're demand deficient for structural reasons, they've got to export to get growth. Because they export to get growth, they get dollars. Because they get dollars, the banking systems are stuck with working with the Fed, and they reproduce this reliance on the dollar and the US economy. Oh, that was a lot in 41 minutes. Fortunately, there's time for questions. And I will defer all, John will answer all the questions. <laughs> he can't, Sarah. Um, 
you do the six paragraph version of this. So look, money is a social relation. Money is a claim on, money is ultimately a debt instrument. It's a, and a debt instrument is a claim on future behavior. Okay? If, if, I, if I say to you, give me your cell phone and I'll give you some pieces of paper that you can redeem later on, you can come to me and I'll do something for you. Give you back the cell phone, chop wood so you have heat in your house in the winter. What money is is a claim on this future behavior. Okay. So people, for kind of obvious reasons over the long history of humanity, basically don't trust pieces of paper. But there's no reason why they shouldn't. And the reason that states can generate money is states have weapons. And so they can compel future behavior. And the future behavior they can compel is taxes. So money that's acceptable by everybody is state money. It's a claim on future tax revenue from the state that you know is backed up by coercion. Okay, that's paragraph one. Paragraph two, I'm gonna do Bitcoin first because uh, it's easier, it takes a short paragraph. Okay, so Bitcoin, who's gonna back that up? That's it. That's all you need to know about Bitcoin. What's it a claim on? It's a claim on other drug dealers and pornographers <laughs> and human traffickers. It's, you can't use it for anything else fundamentally. And the reason you can't use it is it's very difficult. And this, by the way, I don't usually traffic in investment advice, but this is why you really shouldn't put money into Bitcoin because it's very hard to get it out. In the beginning of any kind of Ponzi scheme, it's easy to get your money out. This is fundamentally a Ponzi scheme. Don't put your money into Bitcoin. Give it to me, I'll invest in gold. <laughs> okay. <coughs> gold, China. Um, gold ultimately, I mean, again, relies on people being willing to exchange something for it. Fine. Uh, Chinese are buying gold because it's a way to turn dollars, which they um, have rightly some concern about. So, so dollars are a claim on future American production. The Chinese rightly have some concern about that because all you have to do is read yesterday's newspaper. They're trying to undermine that. So, I mean, they've got to do something with their three and a half trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves, some of which is about two and a half trillion of which is dollars. So they're trying to translate some of those dollars into something they can actually use today. Um, that's not completely crazy, and certainly from their point of view, as I say, since they're trying to undermine it, it's not crazy. The more profound issue is, why don't people use the renminbi? Why is the renminbi, <coughs> renminbi not um, a fundamental challenge to the dollar, comma, right now? And right now means since I'm basically a historian, 20 years, um, barring a world war. Um, the answer is what I was talking about in the last 40 minutes. If you're gonna wanna have your currency used as a reserve currency, <coughs> to any significant degree. You've got to put that currency out in world markets. The Chinese are doing exactly the opposite. They run trade surpluses. So how do you get renminbi out into the world market? Well, you can loan people renminbi, and that's actually what One Belt, One Road is about. Hey, Pakistan, hey, Sri Lanka, here's Venezuela, here's some renminbi. You can borrow money from us. Oh, what can you do with that? Well, you can buy stuff from us. Because over here in the US economy, they don't want renminbi. So um, they can lend it. And the problem with that, it does, I mean, it works. It puts your currency out there. The problem with that is in the long run, you got to pay the money back. And how are you going to pay it back? Again, in the aggregate, somebody's got to be earning net. The whole, sorry, the whole collection of somebody's has to be earning net renminbi for there to be renminbi to buy to settle your claims with China, and that means China has to be a trade deficit economy. So we've just realized what the contradiction is. And we know this is a contradiction because this is what happened in the 1920s. The US was the China of the 1920s in some sense. It ran massive trade surpluses. It recycled those trade surpluses as lending to Europe, Japan, and to a lesser extent, Latin America. And when the lending stopped, but the Americans didn't step forward and start buying things. 
the world economy collapses. This is a short version, there's more steps, but. So the only way for the Chinese to make the RMB a reserve currency is to run a trade deficit. I don't see that. It's not consistent with Chinese state policy right now. Chinese state policy is actually to substitute domestic production for a lot of the stuff they import right now. That's China made in 2025. It's not happening. That's probably eight paragraphs. Mr. Redshirt. <laughs> so we do, so can you talk about how this is set up? Um, is there an incentive for, for example, for Europe to change the system? And for example, how would they go about doing that? Right. Is there a point? Or is it the system as it's set up the best we can do? That's the system we're living with. So the euro emerges from European efforts to deal with some of the consequences of living in a dollarized world. Um, and you guys are all in TAM, so I can just say that and you don't have to, do I have to fill that out? How, who doesn't wanna, if I randomly call on someone to explain the history behind that, are you gonna be like, oh, I need to call a friend? I need a lifeline? 1970, in the 1960s, European currencies would, especially the German Reichsmark, would like to appreciate relative to the dollar from market forces, but of course doing so would harm export capacity. And the problem the Europeans face is not just that it harms exports, but that different European countries are appreciating at different rates, and so the intra-European exchange rates are getting out of alignment. And since European country companies are also selling into the rest of Europe, this is a problem. So from the early 70s on, there's proposals to find some way to lock European currencies together. That's what the European currency snake was in the 1970s. It fails because there's no mechanism to keep them locked together. It's what the exchange rate mechanism was about in the 1980s. It fails because there's no way to lock them together. It's what the euro is about. Oh, now you're locked together. So that's a way of stabilizing exchange rates inside Europe, and from the Germans' point of view, it's also a way of getting the benefits of a currency that's still undervalued. Because the euro is an average, you could say, of European productivity levels. The Germans are high, the Spanish, Greeks, et cetera, are low. And so it's harder for the South to export, it's easy for the North to export. Okay, so this is a way of limiting the consequences of dollarization. Can they go farther than that? I can give you one paragraph. Oh yeah, to put the euro out into world markets as a substitute for American dollar and make the euro the dominant international reserve currency, you've got to run a trade deficit. And if you run a trade deficit, you're probably gonna have, in Europe at least, higher unemployment and slow, slower growth than you already have. Uh, that doesn't work. If you want the long form, the, the 70 paragraph version of the answer to both questions. Uh, Germain, G E R M A I N. And Schwartz, he didn't do any work for this. One article's in, Ru in Review of International Political Economy on the Euro, one's in Review of International Studies on the Red and You can read the long form. But it's basically what I just said. You don't have to read the whole thing. You know, academics, we need to have 50 paragraphs to say something you can say in 10 words. They're not gonna do it. It'll hurt their economy. Other questions? So I, I knew the answer was just especially talking about how it would be something problematic for China for the government to, to move the world reserve currency, but I mean, at the moment, you see China investing in Right, to the extent that these countries need to earn renminbi, um, right, so to do that, A, they have to export, B, they have to either export to China or find someone else who's trade surplus in relation to China. And again, when you aggregate that, that means there's gotta be a, a global trade surplus with China. That's the fundamental problem. 
that, that second point is the fundamental problem. When you boil down to individual debtors, go through that list again. Oh, African countries, Latin America, um, right. These are historically strong exporters, capable of servicing their debts, reliable debtors who don't default. No. The critical number for Africa is that most African countries have a rate of growth of the economy that's lower than the interest rate on the debt they're um, accruing. You can't make that work. For you want to make that personal, this is like, oh yeah, the interest rate on my credit card is, as it often is, 21%, and I'm getting 2% raises every year. Uh, I can see how in the long run that's not gonna work, right? If I don't pay my credit card, assuming I don't make payments and interest keeps building up, my income is, is not growing fast enough to match that accrual of debt. That's why they default. The critical relationship between at a national level between debt and, um, and uh, growth, the critical relationship around the probability of default is just that simple. I mean, you could put more terms into the equation, but um, is the interest rate on the debt above or below the growth rate of the economy? If the economy is growing faster than the uh, interest rate, the, uh, the GDP growth rate is above the interest rate, everything's okay or equal to it, everything's okay, if it's below it, there's going to be a problem. So for those of you who are Americans and constantly hear this rhetoric about, oh my god, our debt is growing so fast, the critical issue is, what's the relationship between the interest rate and the GDP growth rate? Yeah, that's exactly, that's it. I mean, this whole system is based on That's a good question, and that's why we're gonna, that's why you have a problem, but not so much me, I'll be dead. <laughs> because, <laughs> not quite so fast, I hope, but, um, yeah, because the logic, the this, this, this is a, this is a system of social power, it's a, it's a set of social structures, social structures are, are maintained by power, and this particular structure, I mean, it's capitalism, this particular structure is built on growth and financial stability, which ultimately means power. Financial stability ultimately <coughs> is about debt instruments because the debt instruments are what make the assets real. And so again, I'm gonna go back, right? Here's, I got an asset, right? I've loaned you money. There's a, from your point of view, a liability, a debt. From my point of view, it's an asset. I own shares in American companies, that's an asset, but it's somebody else's liability, okay? I own treasury bonds, it's an asset, but it's a claim on someone else's behavior. All those assets rest on compliance in the future by people. So financial stability, in other words, the probability that this system of exploitation and social control will persist, okay? relies on growth because that's the way we've structured it. You've gotta have growth in profits to maintain asset values. You've gotta have growth in the economy to make sure that those government debts will be paid, and so on. Now, it could very well be, in fact it is the case, that that whole system of power is self-destructive. And that's what climate change is about. Um, so the kind of very negative case would be, yeah, we're gonna go off the cliff. We're gonna have a seven degree of Fahrenheit rise in the global temperature. North Carolina and agriculture will disappear. Uh, the coast will be gone. Um, my tombstone in Charlottesville, which is approximately 800 feet above sea level, will be okay. Right? Uh, polar bears, not so good. 
so you can drive really right. Yeah. <laughs> you, okay, you can you can dr now you can do the, the drive Sweden to Finland. If you want. Is there any, uh, so, any yeah. for change? No. So I mean, yeah, there's possibilities for change. I mean, the optimistic case within capitalism is that it's less and less resource intensive. When I grew up, just to make the phone call, there were miles and miles and miles of copper cable that you needed whoever I called. You don't need those miles and miles of copper cable anymore. And the people who are coming online today with telephones, we're not putting in copper lines for them anymore. So a lot of growth is not as resource intensive. Could it be even more so less resource intensive? Certainly. What would that require? It requires a change in politics, so that you don't elect the current administration, and instead you elect people who are like, right, the future of America is not coal. The future of Germany is not soft coal, which is even worse, right? You need people to do that. And actually, I have to say, not to editorialize, you also have to get people to say, all right, we're probably gonna need more nuclear power because we wanna run on electricity, at least it's clean, you can find, we're gonna have to run on electricity, including cars, and to do that, we're gonna need more electricity. Solar, wind, probably some nuclear power. Um, and we need to find more efficient ways of doing it. And there's a politics that could do that. So we're not necessarily gonna go off the cliff. But as I say, more your concern than mine. So you're, you don't sound, you might be an American citizen, but you have accent of English, so I don't know. But I tell my American students, you know, if you care about this, go out and vote. If you're, as many of my students are actually from the deep American South, because UVA gets students from all across the South, you know, yeah, your mom and dad's house is gonna be uninhabitable in 20, 30 years. So you wanna be able to go back to mom and dad's house, you better do something now. It's, your, it's up to you, go out and vote. Young people don't vote in America. So I say, don't complain to me. First of all, I'll be dead, but don't complain to me. <laughs> you don't want this to happen, you go out and vote. I don't know how much drug use it takes to maintain this level of cheerfulness in light of what I think about the world. <laughs> <laughs>